take out your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Exodus, to the book of Exodus, and we are going to be in chapter 15 this morning, chapter 15. When we left the Israelites last week, they had just gotten on the other side of the Red Sea. So when you're reading through the book of Exodus, it's kind of cool. It's almost like it's not an allegory. These events actually happen, but it's almost like then a, a metaphor, an allegory for the, the Christian walk of how God takes us from bondage and applies the blood of the lamb to our lives. And we walk out of Egypt, we walk out of our past free, and then we face the Red Sea. And that's kind of like the baptism and the infilling of the Holy Spirit moment when those waters part and Pharaoh army is, is drowned, and, and so you have that, that amazing moment, and we're going to pick up the story now of the Israelites in Exodus chapter 15, beginning at verse 22, and it begins like this, then Moses led the people out of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved into the, the desert of Sure. I, I, wish, I, I wish this passage wasn't in here, to be honest with you. I wish it went for that, that they left the Red Sea and that the waters closed and they found themselves in the promised land. Wouldn't that be a, wouldn't that be a lot easier? Come on. If you just you left all your problems behind you and then you were, you were in your destiny. And yet we find the Israelites having to walk through desert. That's what happens to us sometimes. God gives us some amazing moments, amazing deliverance, amazing breakthrough, miracles. But then sometimes, sometimes on the other side of your miracle is a little bit of a desert season. And so they're moving into the desert of shore and they traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. You know, the enemy likes to attack us when we're tired and when we're thirsty. And then in verse 23, it says, it says this. It says, when they came to the oasis of Mara. I find, I find that interesting. Say, say oasis. oasis. And then say, say bitter. Because Mara means bitter. It's an oasis. But it's, but it's bitter. That seems, that seems strange to me. When they came to the oasis of Mara, the water was too bitter to drink. And so they called the place Mara, which which means bitter. I want you to imagine this three-day journey through the desert. They're on the other side of the Red Sea. They had pumped their praise. They were exalting God. They had a moment. They had, this was like night four of youth camp. I mean, it was like that kind of a, a service, that kind of a moment. And then they walked through the desert for three days without water. You thought your last vacation with your two-year-old and four-year-old, you thought it was a long, a long ways to get to your destination. But can you imagine three days and, and, and no rest areas? Three, three days without a QT? Are you kidding me? Like you can't go three minutes in Concord without a QT. But they went three, they went three days. There was, there, was no, uh, there was no Wawa, there was no Sheets, there was no whatever, whatever part of the, the country you're, you're joining from today. And, and, and they get there and, and there was an oasis. There was, there was an oasis. I don't know what your favorite rest stop is on the way to the beach. You know, there's that place where, where like uh, Bojangles and Starbucks are, are, are next to each other. Wherever, wherever your, your place is where the whole family, it's like the whole family's happy and they, they're, they're traveling three days. And, and maybe it was on day like two and a half where, where everything around them was brown, but up ahead they see a little bit of green. And everything around them was hot, and, and it looks like, boy, there's just a little bit of coolness up ahead. And, and, and they know that if there's green, there's got to be water. And so can you imagine for, let's say it's like four hours, what are they doing then for four hours? They're building this up in their mind right? They're building it. Oh, there's water up there. There's going to be refreshing. There's springs. I'm going to dive into the pool of water. I can't wait to drink. I can't. And so they're building for four hours. They're building it up. They're building it up. They're building it up. And they get to Mara and they find out it was bitter. Have you ever built something up in your mind and when you got to that place, it wasn't what you expected? Sir, don't look at your wife like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Have you ever been to the place where you, you built it up so much, so much, that, that vacation, that new job, that, let me ask you this way. Have you ever ordered a drink in a restaurant and you just wanted it, that day you wanted a Coke? You're not a, 
usually not a soda drinker, but you wanted that little bit of carbonation. You wanted that, that sweetness, and so you ordered a Coke, and, and the server brought you your Coke, and it was in a, uh, uh, maybe in a colored glass with a, with a lid on it, and you were expecting, you had built it up in your mind. It had been, it'd been a couple of weeks since you'd had a Coke, and you were expecting, and, and you raised the glass to your lips, and you, you inhaled, you took that deep gulp, and it was sweet tea. And you may even love sweet tea, but what's the problem? You had built it up in your mind as one thing, and even though it was good, it wasn't what you expected. Can I preach this to some newlyweds? (laughs) Can I preach this to the engaged couple in the house today? That for months you will build this thing up in your mind and then we'll, we'll go see Pastor Steve and Brandy. They'll, they'll fix you. <laughs> but we do that, don't we? We do it with all kinds of things. We build things up in our mind. And even though the thing might not be a bad thing, it wasn't what we are, uh, expected. And yet, so this is, can I give it this to you? This is called the recipe for disappointment. And disappointment is the root of bitterness. That's what happened in Mara. They had built it up in their mind. I thought Mara was going to be this thing, but it wasn't this thing. And so it was bitterness. It was bitterness. And so you build it up I think that this time all this new boss I know my old boss he didn't like me he promoted everybody else he didn't see the work I did I came in early but my new boss my new boss is going to be the source of my success he's going to be the source of my favor and you build up the new job and the new boss and even though it might be good it wasn't what you expected and so you were disappointed and then you got bitter at your new boss hello I made you mad. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. We can do this, you can do this, you can do this with a preacher. Right? You build it up. Oh, I, I expect, I expect Pastor Doug to do this. I expect him to preach this way. And if I don't meet your expectations, even though what I'm saying might be biblical, I didn't, oh, I bet, I bet this this week is the week that Pastor Doug's pants are not going to be too short. (laughs) Look, look, I will, I'm just telling you, I will disappoint you in ways you haven't even thought of yet. If your expectation, if you're putting your expectation in me, in a person, in a church, in a system, in anything other than God Almighty, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And that's how the enemy works. The enemy works. Do you know the devil will be your best friend in Mara? The devil's your best friend in Mara. The devil is the most comforting voice that you will hear in Mara. The devil in Mara sounds like this. Come on, I know, I know that spouse didn't treat you right. I know she didn't compliment you. I know, I know, I know she wasn't appreciative. I know, and the, the devil said, come on, come on, just drink, just drink a little bit of water. And then here's what the enemy does is he takes just a drop. See, it's just a drop of bitterness. It doesn't, you don't need a lot of bitterness, just a drop of bitterness. And that word commentators say uh, that that word bitter actually probably means poison. See, the devil doesn't need a lot of poison in your soul. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. See, the attack against the Israelites, it was external, right? It was external. And so I knew the enemy. I see the the taskmasters and I know that I got to make these bricks and I see Pharaoh's army chasing me. Now watch this, Christian, because this attack This attack is after Israel is saved. And what happens is after you accept Jesus into your heart and into your life, oftentimes the enemy will shift the attack from an external attack to an internal attack. And the internal attack is to try to get you to drink in bitterness. To try to get you offended. And can I just tell you that offense 
happens more in the church than it does in the world. Because that's how tricky the devil is. I'm expecting, I'm out there, I expect that somebody doesn't treat me right or, 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 or uh, the situation didn't work out. But, but this is in the church and the enemy would work your mindset up in a, in a way. And I've said this, but let me just put it on the screen for you to write down. Often the root of bitterness is disappointment. Often the root of bitterness is disappointment. Disappointment occurs when I place my hope in something or someone other than God to meet my needs. So here's the recipe for bitterness. The recipe for bitterness is I thought that, and fill, fill in the blank, I thought that, but in reality. But in reality. I thought that, but in reality. And so what the enemy does is he tries to fill that void with bitterness. So pastor, how do I, how do I know because they were just at the Red Sea, right? They were, three, they were three days away from one of their greatest praise moments, and all of a sudden they're susceptible to bitterness. See, sometimes it doesn't take long for us to lose our praise. Some, some of us lose our praise in the parking lot before we get. Some of us lo will lose our praise in the drive through after service today. Some of us will lose our praise when we wake up and it's raining again tomorrow. Some of us, see, see it's, it, it doesn't take a lot. It takes a lot. It takes, here's what I know. It takes a lot to build something up and not a lot of time to lose it. I, I, I know that you can work out for six months and see about this much gain and you don't work out for one week and it's all gone. I know that it takes a long time to pump up something, but, the, but the, it doesn't take a lot of time to lose it. So, so how do we know that, it's, that we're susceptible to this? Verse 24, it says, Then the people complained, and then they turned. They complained, and they turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? They demanded, complained, and turned, and demanded, complained, and turned, and demanded. So how do I know if I'm susceptible to bitterness? It's right there in that verse. Number one, a complaining spirit is connected to a bitter spirit. Because... Your strength is connected to your song. Your power is connected to your praise. And so the enemy knows that. So he will try to get you to turn your praise into complaining. Because if your strength is in your song, your weakness is in your complaining. And the devil will steal your joy and he'll steal your victory. And he'll steal your strength by turning a praising spirit into a complaining spirit. Number two, then it will move from a complaining spirit to a lack of honor of leadership. A lack of honor of leadership is connected to a bitter spirit. So they weren't just complaining. They were complaining against who? Against Moses. Because we are, we're people, and so people like to have a person to blame. And so if my circumstances don't turn out the way I think that they should turn out, then I'm usually going to blame a person, and often I will blame my leader, my coach, my, my mentor, my, my uh, uh, teacher, whatever it is, your boss, anybody in leadership, they often get the blunt of the criticism and then number three a demanding spirit a demanding spirit is connected to a bitter spirit and so if I find myself complaining or if I find myself demanding what I need to do is I need to take evaluation of the spiritual gauges in my life and just say maybe I need to step back a little bit because I could be as susceptible to a bitter spirit see some men carry their prisons with them and it's poison and it'll poison your, your soul. Um, Matthew, Matthew 13 tells us this. This happened in the day of Jesus. Verse 56 in Matthew 13. All his sisters were living right here among us. Where did he learn all of these things, they ask? And they were deeply, they were deeply what? They were deeply offended. They were deeply offended and they refused to believe in him. Why were they offended at Jesus? Because they had built it up in their minds that Jesus was going to be this kind of person. He was going to say these things. He was going to do these things. And they couldn't reconcile it in their mind that we know who Jesus brothers and sisters are we know where he comes from and so Jesus was too he was too ordinary you know a lot of people missed Jesus not because of his miracles but because he was too ordinary sometimes you will miss the greatest move of God in your life because you build it up to be something and Jesus was moving in the in the subtle ways and you missed it you missed 
Jesus. And then Jesus told them, this is, why, this is why bitterness is so dangerous. This is why a spirit of offense is so dangerous. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere in his hometown and among his own family. And so he only did a few miracles there because of your unbelief. And so what I'm doing is I'm begging you today as your pastor not to drink the water. Because if you drink the water of offense and bitterness, it will actually prevent Jesus from doing, the miracle, from doing miracles and doing the supernatural in your life. That's what happens. We have to understand, you have to understand that everybody has to walk through Mara. I wish that, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish nobody would hurt you. I wish nobody would offend you. I, I, I wish that, every, that everybody would treat you right, that everything would go your way. But we know that's not true. People are going to leave you. A father's going to abandon you. A spouse is going to end the marriage, and, and, and you didn't want to end the marriage. A business partner is going to double-cross you. Like these things, every we have to go through Mara. I wish we could detour around Mara. I wish we could fly over Mara. I wish there was a shortcut around Mara, but there's not. If you have accepted Jesus Christ in your, as your Lord and Savior, then you will, you will have opportunity to be offended. Jesus says it in Luke chapter 17. He says, it is impossible that no offenses should come. So Jesus himself said, people are going to do you wrong. People are going to mistreat you. They're going to leave you. They're going to abandon you. They're going to betray you. And so you have to go through Mara, but Mara doesn't have to be in you. That's what we have to understand. Just because you're in Mara doesn't mean that Mara has to be in you. Can I implore you, don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. I know the enemy is saying, just get bitter. I know he's saying, get offended. I know he's saying, get angry. Don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. Nobody is forcing you to drink the water. The only person, the only, hear me, the only person that can choose to ingest the poison of bitterness into your soul is yourself. And if you choose to ingest it, you can choose to refuse it. I'm not going to do it. I might be in Mara, but I'm not going to let Mara get in me. I'm not going to let it take my anointing. I'm not going to let it take my calling. I'm not going to let it steal my family. I'm not going to let it steal my joy. Just because somebody t didn't treat me the way that I expected them to treat me does not mean that I'm not continue, going to continue serving God, serving in ministry. This is how the enemy gets people out of ministry. Because they built ministry. I thought ministry, watch this, I thought ministry was going to fulfill me. Ministry won't fulfill you. Only God can fulfill you. But if you think that ministry will fulfill you, you will get into ministry and somebody will hurt you. Somebody will say something unkind to you. And there's the enemy. See? See, I told you those Christians. I told you those Christians are going to treat you wrong. And they'll try to get you to ingest that. Here's, here's why it's so important that we, that we choose to live an unoffendable life. That's your, that's your superpower. That's your superpower, church, is when you, choose, when you choose to live unoffendable. See, when you choose to live an unoffendable life, number one, all y'all want me to share my password with you, apparently. This keeps popping up. Y'all have that feature on there? Everybody, all my staff is like, share the password, share the password. I'm not going to share the password. Anyway, it just keeps popping up on my iPad. But when you choose to live, now they're offended at me. I'm just teasing. They don't do, they don't do that. When you, live, when you live unoffendable, here's what happens. You're truly free. You're truly free. Offenses will come, but they're not going to be in me. They're not going to live in me. Somebody makes a decision that I don't agree with. That's okay. I'm going to move on. Somebody says something to me. They must have had a bad day. I'm not going to, I'm not going to receive that in my spirit. I am truly free. The second thing that happens is that you access healing. You access healing. So then the story goes on to say, it was there at Mara that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. And he said, if you will listen to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commandments and keeping all his decrees, 
Then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases that I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I don't think it's coincidence that this is the first time that the Lord talks about the promise of physical healing. And where is it? It's in Mara. Do you know how many times, how many stories I hear and have read from physicians, from psychologists, and from pastors that it was when somebody released the offense, they got their physical healing. I've been holding on to my dad leaving for 48 years, and I finally released it, and now my high blood pressure is gone. I hadn't talked to my sister in 38 years, but I forgave her, and now the cancer is gone. Now hear me. Hear your pastor. Not all sickness is caused by this. We live in a fallen world. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Christians get COVID and non-Christians get COVID. We all, we all live in this fallen world, but I can tell you this. If you have drank the poison of bitterness and offense, it will affect your physical health. It will affect you spiritually. It will affect you your, your mentally, and it will affect all of all of yourself because we are holistic people third thing is that when we choose to live an unoffendable life we access the next step towards our destiny i love what's on the other side of mara verse 27 says after leaving mara the israelites traveled on to the oasis of elam where they found 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there beside the water. See, if you choose just to keep on moving through Mara, I'm not going to live in Mara. I'm not going to build a house in Mara. I'm not even, even going to stop at a, a, at a Hampton Inn in Mara. I'm not going to eat at the restaurant in Mara. I'm going to get right back on the road. Mara may have happened to me, but I'm not going to build my life in bitterness. I'm not going to live here. I'm not going to live here. I'm getting back on. And you know what's on the other side of Mara? Elam is on the other side of Mara. The next step of your destiny is on the is right on the other side of the person who hurt you who betrayed you who offended you I'm not glad it happened but I'm glad for where the Lord has taken you on the other side if you say I'm not going to drink the water God has better water for you on the other side if you say I'm not going to live an offendable life I am going to live an unoffendable life what the Lord will do is he will begin to open up he will begin to open up a real oasis for you it's like your yard. It's like your yard right now. I know, I know there's frost on your yard. I know there's three feet of water on your yard. But, but have you seen just a little bit of the day lilies starting to break? starting to break through. That's what I see happening for you. I know it's been a hard, cold winter. I know people have offended you. I know people have done you wrong. I know not everything has gone your way, but I see spring beginning to break forth, but you can't live in winter. Spring is coming. Elam is coming. Blessing is coming. Favor is coming. Anointing is coming, but it isn't going to come unless we move on from Mara. But she say this, Pastor, but, but what do I do with Mara? Because the hurt is real, right? The betrayal was real. The offense was real. I can't just ignore it. And I feel like, Pastor, I feel like that poison tempts me every day to, to, to lash back out, to do retaliation by rally. Do you know what that is? Instead of taking the problems to the Lord, you just get other people on your side and to console you of how terrible the other person is or, or to get revenge. And so what do you do? Like, what do you, what do you do with this Mara situation that's so real? And other people, here's the thing sometimes, is other people can't see it, right? Other people can't see it. Well, I don't understand why she would be upset at that. No, you don't, you don't know what really happened. Other people don't know how deep the poison went. Other people don't understand how bad the abuse was. And so they look and they say, oh, what's the big deal? And they don't understand. Can I tell you that sometimes other people are not going to understand? So what do you do? What do you do with the reality of Mara? We do the same thing that Moses did. If they go on and, and, and are actually backtrack to this verse, this is what 
the Lord told Moses to do in Marah. And what the Lord told Moses to do in Marah is the same thing that I believe he's telling us to do in Marah. It says, so Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him, this is, this is strange to me. It's a strange way, I don't know if this will work when you, when you um, dig a well, and instead of doing culligan, you just take a piece of water and throw it in. Like, this is kind of strange here. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink? A piece of wood? I don't recommend that, by the way, if you're out in the wilderness and there's like a pond and there's scum on the pond and just throw the piece of wood in the pond. Don't do that. Bear Grylls would tell you, don't do that. But a, but a piece of wood in the water? A piece of wood in the water took, it took the bitterness away. The, bitter, the reality of the bitterness happened, but the piece of wood took the bitterness away. And as I read that, I started thinking, you know what I started thinking about? I started thinking about another piece of wood. That's what I started thinking about, was another piece of wood. Fast forward 3,000 years when, when there was somebody that walked this earth and all he did was, was love people and heal people and reach out to people. But his own disciples left them. They didn't believe in him. And people were cheering for him one day and they turned on him the next day. And they were shouting Hosanna and then they were shouting crucify him. And the religious leaders never, never liked him. Leadership never, he never got along with leadership. And, and they took this man whose name was Jesus and they put him on an old rugged cross. Put him on that old rugged cross. And when Jesus could have been bitter, when Jesus could have said, look at my disciples, they're leaving me. I don't understand. I did miracles in front of you. I fed, I fed you. You saw the fish and you saw the loaves. You saw it multiply in front of you. And those were the same people that were shouting crucify him. And Jesus could have hung on that old rugged cross. And he could have drank the water. What did they offer him to drink on the cross? What did they offer him to drink? It was bitter. It was bitter. And Jesus hung on the cross and he refused the bitterness in that moment. And he said these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I am so sorry for what happened to you. I'm so sorry for how somebody hurt you, offended you. I can't go back and undo that, but I can offer that same old rugged cross to you today. If you will invite the cross into your bitterness, if you invite it into the abuse, if you invite it into the divorce, if you'll invite it into the hurt, into the pain, into the situation, if you will invite the cross in, there will be healing that takes place in your life. Here's, here's what I know about hiking and camping, which is not a lot, but I, but I know this. Pastor Kevin, when we were hiking on the Appalachian Trail a couple of, a couple of years ago, we didn't, we didn't store up water with us. I mean, we took some, but we didn't, we didn't load down our packs with gallons of water. What we, what we brought with us was just a filter. It was a filter. And so we were able to take water from a source that was contaminated, but is but as long as we applied the filter, it didn't matter how contaminated the water was. It didn't matter what was in the water. There could have been disease in the water. Could have been sickness in the water. There could have been all kinds of stuff in the water. But if we applied the right filter to the water, it's not about what happened to you. It's about what filter are you going to apply. Before it gets to your heart, will you let it go through the filter of the cross? Jesus, filter it through the cross because you forgave me. 
I can forgive because I abandoned you, Jesus, and you chased after me. I filled her it. I filled her it with heads bowed and eyes closed. In this place, you would say, Pastor, that's me. I've got a Mara in my life that I need to filter through the cross. I just need to let it pass through the blood of Jesus. If that's you, if somebody's hurt you, if somebody's left you, abandoned you, if you're dealing with Amara today, or maybe it was 48 years ago, but you would say, I never truly forgave. Would you just lift up your hand and say, say, that's me, that's me. Would you pray for me? Sure, 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 sure. Would you just take a moment? If that's you, and would you, just, would you just ask that the Lord would pass that person, pass that situation through the filter of the cross. God, don't let it get into my heart. Don't let it get into my spirit. I won't drink the water in Mara until it passes through the cross. I know that Jesus forgave me, and so I'm going to forgive. I know that Jesus loved me, and so I'm going to love. I know that he gave me mercy, and so I'm going to extend mercy. He gave me grace, and so I'm going to give grace. Just let it pass through the filter of the cross and I cut off bitterness from your life and I cut off offense from your life and I speak over you right now and I declare over you that this church will not live in Mara. We will not stop in Mara. Your life doesn't end in Mara. I declare that over you. Child of God, right here, right now, I declare that the end of your life and the end of your story, it doesn't end in Mara. You move on to Elam. You move on to destiny. You move on to greater anointing. You move on to greater promise. You move on to greater blessing. I declare that over every child of God in the houses as you release offense, as you release bitterness, as you take your eyes off a man right now, as you take your eyes off of a person and put them onto Jesus and say, only you, Jesus, only you can heal me. Only you can provide for me. Only you can fill me. Only you can forgive me. And then, Lord, if there's anybody here today that has not accepted Christ, into their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray that as I pray this prayer out loud that they would pray. And if that's you, just go ahead and pray this in your heart. Just say something like, Jesus, forgive me. I know that I'm a sinner, but I come to the cross. I believe that you died and rose again. And I ask you to come into my heart and come into my life and help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose in Jesus name. Come on, you're going to live unoffendable. You are unoffendable. You are unoffendable. Everything through the filter of the cross. If you receive that, can you give the Lord one more hand clap of praise this morning? <laughs>